Eleven years after their worst national tragedy, Americans gathered at where the towers of the World Trade Center once stood. But this year, several politicians and family members of victims were barred from speaking. For many, that silence was ironic, as each passing year since the attacks, questions have only grown in number, while official answers have at best been scarce. An empty hall, marking the site where the World Trade Center's twin towers, symbols of America's might, once stood. Eleven years on, many Americans are still unhappy with the government's account of what happened on September 11, 2001. According to Washington, on that morning, 19 Arab men, armed with box cutters and acting as agents for Al-Qaeda chief Osama bin Laden, who was then hiding in remote mountains in Afghanistan, hijacked four commercial American airliners, bypassing the most advanced security and intelligence system the world has ever known. The planes ran off course for hours without being intercepted and hit the two towers of the World Trade Center and the Pentagon right on spot. When informed of the attack of the first tower, then-President George W. Bush kept reading My Pet Goat to children in a Florida school. A passport belonging to one of the hijackers was found intact near the site of the 9-11, as well as flight manuals written in Arabic in a nearby car's glove compartment. Unhappy with the U.S. handling of the situation, the victims' families fought for an inquiry. The 9-11 Commission was founded. The underfunded body basically rubber-stamped the U.S. government's story and was accused by many of being a cover-up. Then-President Bush and Vice President Dick Cheney were forced to testify, but no one knows what they said because they testified behind closed doors, off the record, and not under an oath. But the government's official account reads more like the script of a bad action movie and more and more people are daring to ask questions. One such group is the Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. It consists of more than 1,600 professionals. They say government's probes have not addressed the massive evidence for explosive demolition of the World Trade Center and the mysterious case of the World Trade Center Building No. 7, which collapsed on itself without being hit. On the day of the attacks, Israeli Mossad agents were arrested near the 9-11 site and released later. Many now believe that the spy agency's fingerprints are everywhere. And as a man with a PhD in history, I want to go on hard, cold facts. And the hard, cold facts that we have, without any dispute, is the fact that five Israelis were arrested in New York, Mossad agents, uh, filming and documenting the attack. They were cheering the attack, according to all the witnesses involved. Uh, they were absolutely, certainly Mossad agents. They failed lie detector tests. We know that Israeli agents were in the same street as Mohammed Atta. We have lots of evidence that Israel had a huge spy operation going on in the United States at this time. A growing awareness campaign is taking shape in the United States. Polls show that more than 50% of Americans believe that Al-Qaeda was not behind the 9-11 attacks. This makes many wonder why the Western media shy away from alternative narratives to the government's story. More than a decade on, many are still arguing that for the sake of the 9-11 victims, it's everyone's duty to demand answers from the government and to seek the truth about what really happened on the morning of September 11, 2001. Well, joining me now live from Washington is Mr. Webster Griffin, Tarpley author and historian. I'd also like to welcome our guest in London, Mr. Chris Bambry, journalist, writer and broadcaster, and with us from New York, Caleb Mopin International Action Center. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for being with us. My first question to our guest in New York, Mr. Mopin, how has the public discourse on 9-11 changed in these past 11 years. Let's first start uh, this debate with how the public's view on this has changed, if it has. Well, after 9-11, there was endless uh, humanization of the victims, and the TV news showed numerous times the lives and, that were affected by this terrorist attack. However, however, after 9-11, um, the U.S. launched the War on Terror. And three million people have most likely died as a result of the U.S. invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan, the bombing campaigns. But do we ever get to find out who these people are? Do we ever get to hear their names? Do we ever get to find out how these lives have been destroyed by the U.S.? No, we don't. The 9-11 narrative that's been created is a gross example of what's known as, quote, American exceptionalism, unquote, 
which is the idea that the lives of people in the United States are far more important than the lives of the people in the rest of the world. 9-11, uh, some 3,000 people died on 9-11, but millions have died as a result of U.S. wars around the world. Hmm. But the media narrative is unconcerned with those people and sees them as just, you know, collateral damage to be, to be you know, to be ignored and to be passed over. And that hmm. is a disgusting part of the way the media has presented 9-11. The, right. the U.S., uh, the Pentagon are the greatest terrorists in the world, but we never hear about their crimes. Right. Let's just go to London on this. Chris Bambury, if 9-11 was actually the result of, of the failure of the national security state to deter, uh, deter an attack, uh, a lot of observers are saying, then the government's refusal to conduct a real investigation is even a greater failure. So basically, we heard, for, for instance, this year a lot of the family members were not allowed to speak out. Why is accountability still an unaddressed issue, even if we go with the official story of what actually caused the attack? Why did that happen? Why did the, for instance, security apparatus was not able to stop it? Well, of course, accountability and democracy are things which are very absent in America and in the West European democracies. It's a, it's a problem right across the Western, uh, Western world. But I think you've got to say is that since 9-11, we have seen a massive expansion of that security apparatus, a massive expansion of essentially repress, uh, rep repress, a repressive machine in America and indeed other countries around, uh, around the world. And there is no questioning about this. There's never going to be any questioning about this. To give you a, an, exa a, 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 an example, it's a bit like NATO. You know, NATO reinvented itself after the collapse of the Soviet Union and has become this aggressive alliance launching wars in Afghanistan around the world. There's never any discussion of any of this. This is never held up for a public debate. And I think your previous speaker was right. The real questions about 9-11, if you like, was George W. Bush might have been reading a children's story in Florida but Donald Rumsfeld was within hours dusting down plans which were already there to invade Iraq, even though there was no Iraqi involvement whatsoever in that attack. They were already ready to launch an attack into, Af into Afghanistan, even though it wasn't Af Af an Afghani, uh, no Afghani involvement in 9-11. Mm -hmm. And subsequent to that, we've seen the extension of the wars into, Sudan, into Somalia, into Yemen, into Pakistan. America seems to have no understanding that there may be people in the world who resent what it does and in the CIA's terrible term, blowback, right. are prepared to strike back against the evil empire. Well, the thing is, again, these are being uh, an effort to set the stage for the U.S. war in Afghanistan, in Iraq, uh, or the continuous U.S. presence actually in the region. Back to Caleb Morpin on this. Uh, Caleb, the thing is, the question that those uh, who are supporting the official view of what happened in 9-11, the question that they raise is why would America, or rather would America target so many of its own citizens uh, to go ahead with that agenda if that's the case? Well, it is interesting to think about it because I don't know what Al-Qaeda gained from this attack, but I do know that George W. Bush uh, and the bankers on Wall Street gained tremendously from 9-11. They were able to invoke the names of dead, innocent people in the Twin Towers and use them to promote their wars ab abroad. And so they certainly gained fr from the attacks far more than any other party. So that, 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 is, that is certainly a reason to hold the official story in suspect. Uh, you know, we may never know how, to what extent, you know, they let this happen or to what extent, you know, they were asleep at the wheel. We'll never really know. What we do know is that these wars cannot continue and that there are millions of people around the world who have a justifiable hatred for the U.S. government for what was done uh, to their countries. Uh, you know, September 11th, 1973 was a coup d'etat in which the people of Chile had their democratic government overthrown. 20,000 people were murdered by Pinochet, a backed U.S. thug. But no one ever talks about that 9-11, you mm -hmm. know. And there's countless other examples of U.S. aggression abroad. But that never is allowed to be part of the narrative, especially not today. There's no parades commemorating the victims of the millions of people the U.S. has slaughtered around the world. There's, there's, no, there's no parade commemorating the people of Vietnam or the people of Korea or the, or the people in Latin America who have been killed by U.S. Contras. 
you know, so, so the fact that they don't seem to matter in this discourse and the fact that, you know, 3,000 innocent Americans are now being used to promote war wars abroad, which kill more and more people, mm -hmm. that's a really disgusting aspect of U.S. society and how much the media is really just an arm of the 1% to rile up the population to support mm -hmm. them in their efforts to reap profit from human death and destruction. Right, Chris Bambri, the thing is, uh, over the years we've seen a lot of questions being raised and as, as was said earlier and in that report that we saw at the start of the program, a lot of questions are still uh, being raised by experts, by specialists, by people inside and outside of America. And again, that question of how the public view is being affected by all this. Caleb Mopin saying there that maybe we will never know what actually happened in 9-11. Do you think, however, that the doubts that have been put forward and some of those doubts being described as very credible, that these are going to change how the public, at least in America, is looking at this? And will that affect anything? Well, I think there's going to be a debate about 9-11 uh, to come. And that actually, because there is these doubts, that debate will continue. You don't have to accept the idea this was an inside operation to question what happened in 9-11 and in particular how 9-11 was used because the American state moved seamlessly in reaction to 9-11. It moved seamlessly towards intervention around, around the world. It was a, a God-given opportunity in many ways for the Americans, and they seized on it ruthlessly to implement plans which were already there, as I said, to attack, attack Iraq and to carry out this war in terror. And since then, we've seen 11 years, and you know, my fellow guest is absolutely right, in many tens of thousands of more people have died in the wars that America and its allies have unleashed than died in the Twin Towers. And yet, there is no recognition. President Obama today was in New York. There is no recognition that really what those wars and what those occupations do and what America's support for Israel does is fuel resentment against America and could well drive people towards those actions. They can't discuss that because actually that would be a questioning of all of America's foreign policy and its strategic uh, uh, goals around the world. That discussion cannot be allowed. And therefore, I don't believe there is going to be a public discussion about what's wrong with the official narrative about 9-11 because it goes to the heart of, of American foreign policy, American domestic mm. policy, and then they don't want to open that discussion because it opens up a whole can of worms that mm. Obama and no other American president will allow. Right. Well, yet at the same time, back to Caleb Morpin on this, uh, First of all, when the first questions were officially raised, or rather uh, went viral on the internet about the uh, authenticity of what was uh, announced by the government in America on 9-11, a lot was said about how this is going to be insulting or offensive to the families of those who've been uh, killed in, in those terrorist attacks. And later on, the issue of the conspiracy culture, uh, people saying that these are all conspiracy theorists uh, and they're not, vi they're not rather, uh, you can't verify what they're saying. And, and now people saying that if some part of the government basically was involved in this at all, well, 11 years have passed, how come nobody's come out and said anything about this? Uh, what's your response to that? Well, my response is that we will never know. You know, we really don't know. Uh, it is interesting that, you know, with all of their security apparatus and NORAD and all of these forces, somehow... 9-11 was still pulled off, but we'll never know, and th there's no way to be sure. But it is clear that the way in which the 3,000 innocent people have, have been used, their death has been utilized for propaganda purposes, which is very disgusting. And the families, their families do owe, are owed an honest explanation of what happened on 9-11, and they haven't gotten that. All they've gotten is drum beating for war, propaganda and and more death and that's the only thing that they've gotten and that shows mm. what really what this system has to offer you know uh, war is a built-in part of the US capitalist economy at this point military corporations and contractors are are, are the the lifeblood of, of the one percent in this country so it's no surprise that no matter what happens they'll try to utilize it to whip people up into support the fact that so many people are questioning the narrative of what happened on 9-11 shows that people in this country are waking up and they are starting to question the, the authoritarian culture in the U.S. where when the government says something and, and the rulers promote something in their media, you just blindly walk behind it and obey it. And the fact that there are so many conspiracy theories and so many, so many, uh, so many different alternative mm -hmm. ideas about what's go what happened on 9-11 shows that people in their bones are knowing something's wrong. When there are houses that are empty and have been foreclosed on all throughout this country, something's clearly wrong. 
when there's mass unemployment in this country like we haven't seen in a long time, something's clearly wrong. People are pouring into the right. streets, they're questioning this, and, and we're starting to see the people of the U.S. start to line up with their true allies, which are people all over the world, which are also victims of the 1% and mm -hmm. the bankers. And they're starting to align with the, with, the, with the rest of the world against the bankers and the corporations, and that's a very mm -hmm. positive development. So basically, Caleb Morpin there telling us that what should be viewed, at least as a fact here, uh, if we can prove the other aspects of this, is that the, what happened in 9-11 has basically led the United States into wars in the region that are still continuing now and taking lives. Uh, Chris Bambri, the thing is, uh, parts of the U.S. government responsible for this, uh, the Israeli Mossad uh, also being held accountable for what happened in 9-11. Do you think that this was, uh, as a lot of observers have been saying in various analyses, a U.S.-Israeli project to wage wars in, in the region in terms of the uh, global interest thereafter, do you think that the hands of Israel are obvious in this or we can't tell for sure? Well, I think there already was a plan and it's been a long time coming to use American military might in a demonstrative way that would bring all the other capitalist powers in the, white, in the world into line behind America to gain control of Middle Eastern oil, which other major countries, European countries, depend on, so that America would have leverage over them through its control of military oil, to surround China and Russia and indeed Iran with American bases right across the region, and I have to say potentially China as well. That plan was already there, and to use American military power, as I say, to offset its relative economic decline. The Israelis are very much part of that plan and we know there's coordination between the Americans and the Israelis over many, many military things. At the moment over Iran, despite a fake war of words which is going on between Obama and Netanyahu. So I think that project was there. It was part of that neoconservative project and I repeat, within literally hours of 9-11, the plans for invading Iraq were put in place by Donald Rumsfeld, who showed them to George Bush as soon as he returned to Washington. You know, that plan was there. It was waiting for an opportunity like 9-11 to happen. Mm. So clearly there was uh, you know, people who were, wait, as I say, waiting for that opportunity. Whether we'll ever know, I don't know, but I'll tell you this. It will require the families of those who died to find out just as the families of the people who were the victims of the Lockerbie, uh, the airliner that came down in Lockerbie in Scotland, had to campaign mm. against the official narrative of that story and have driven a coach and horses through the official story that we were, told, uh, uh, we were told of about that. But it mm. requires a campaign by those families to get it. That's the only way we'll ever get to the truth, in my opinion. Right. Well, of course, we know that there has been an investigation in the United States about 9-11 carried out by what was called the 9-11 Investigation Commission. But, Caleb Morpin, I'd like to put this question to you. One member of that commission, uh, you, of course, must know, resigned. He said the investigation was a farce. Uh, the chairman and the, the legal counsel of that commission said that it was set up to fail, that it didn't receive resources, etc. Basically, w one would think, uh, one observer was saying, that these revelations would cause a kind of sensation. However, the news media, the Congress, the White House uh, and the public were silent on this. And this is not just uh, the only case. We know that a lot of times when we expect, for instance, the media, especially in the United States, uh, to bring something up that's very questionable concerning 9-11 or uh, even the U.S. wars, they're not brought up. And that brings us to the question of the role of the media, either knowingly or unknowingly, preventing people from uh, investigating the facts. Caleb, can you hear me? It looks like we've just lost our connection there with Caleb Morpin, uh, but we'll try to bring him back, though. So let's just go back to Chris Bambury in London. Chris, I don't know if you got all the question. The role of the media in yeah. all of this, do you think that they're uh, knowingly or unknowingly, again, having a role I in how the people perceive the facts? Well, the people who own the media and the people who largely write or produce the media in America, in Britain and elsewhere, are part of what Caleb calls the 1%, the elite. And they are tied into this. I mean, the, the media is dominated by multinational corporations closely cannot, tied to the U.S. state, closely tied to the British state. They're not going to particularly question this unless pressure comes on them. 
And therefore, I think we are seeing a situation where more and more people are questioning the information we're given by the media and looking towards alternative news sources via the internet, social media and elsewhere. And indeed Press TV, which I know is a many young people in Britain, for instance, watch because they want to get a different angle, angle in the world from what they're fed by institutions like the BB, uh, BBC. So I think there's a questioning about this. There's a question about democracy in general, as I said. You know, you mentioned an investigation into 9-11 where Bush and Cheney give evidence not under oath and in camera. We'll never know what was said. You know, how can you have an investigation hmm. where the President of the United States and his Vice President appears in this way? It's a joke. It's just the same in this country, in Britain. You have official commissions made up of the elite investigating the actions of the elite, usually taking months, even years, before they reach some sort of report, by which time people have forgotten the issue which they're report are reporting on. You know, people are getting cynical, they're questioning this, and looking for alternatives. And that's why I think we've seen a growing rejection by the population whenever they're polled in Britain, in America, and elsewhere, of these military adventures, whether it's most recently in Libya, whether it was in Iraq or Afghanistan. There is a growing dichotomy between what actually the populations of these, of, uh, these countries believe and what the leaders are trying to tell them they should believe. And that dichotomy is something which I think is going to grow as it becomes obvious there are big social and economic problems as well as military problems around, uh, around the world. The right. good news is, certainly what I'm saying from is, for instance, people in Britain don't support the war in Afghanistan, the ongoing war and occupation, they're against it. However, that's not been enough to stop the British government tailing behind the Americans. Right. Well, the thing is, those who are saying that uh, actually all this was uh, pre-planned uh, and it was about, rather, the plans that the United States may have in, in terms of controlling uh, the Middle East region, they've been referring, for instance, to the Iraq and Afghanistan wars. We know now the basis for those wars is under question. The, what happened in Libya, you mentioned there, the U.S. presence in Yemen, and now increasingly how the United States is going to act in Syria being discussed. Do you think that we are going to see, based on this analysis, a continuation of U.S. efforts to control the region, especially the Middle Eastern region, including Syria? Yes, I think you are, and I think we are heading towards some form of intervention in Syria. I am very worried about the noises coming for an attack on, on Iran, and I don't think we should be fooled by the supposed war of words between Obama and Netanyahu. The American build-up is proceeding in the Persian Gulf and in that region. And I think we have to be very aware. People should know the history. You mentioned the Iran-Iraq war. People should know that America egged on and armed Saddam Hussein to attack the Islamic Republic of Iran. That when the Iraqis were not doing well, they intervened. When it looked like the Iranians were, might win in that war, the Americans sent ships into the Persian Gulf and shot down mm. an Iranian civil uh, airliner. These are important things to remember because it goes counter to the whole narrative we were fed right. that you know, Saddam Hussein was the evil man. And I think it's important people know those. And people are getting to hear that alternative message and know there is a different version of history out there. Thank you very much, Chris Bambury, journalist, writer and broadcaster, joining me there live from London. A big thank you. I'd also like to make to our guest in New York, who is with us, Caleb Morpin, the, the International Action Centre. Unfortunately, we lost him at the middle of the show. And also, Dr. Webster Griffin Tarpley, we expected to be in the show as well, but unfortunately, we, didn't, uh, we weren't able to establish a good connection with him. Thank you very much for staying with another edition of News Analysis with me, Homa Lesgi. Until our next programme, goodbye.